Climate change is one of the most pressing issues we are facing today. You know that, I know that, and most people out there know that. We have to take action. We need to decide what to do. On a local level, we as a community, on a personal level, what do I have to change? But also on a national and global level, what do we as a community have to change? We are lucky to live in a democratic society, so we have the ability to influence our society, to influence the system. We can take action, we can influence politics by voting the right parties, by going on, on protests. We have different opportunities. But we also have the obligation to do so. A democratic society only works through the engagement of its citizens. But before we go out there, we go and protest, we have to find our own opinion about the different topics. We need to become informed citizens to make the right decisions, to support the right decisions. So we need some kind of knowledge. Knowledge to take all these opportunities we have. Where does this knowledge come from? Climate change is not a new topic. Nevertheless, it came only up in the recent years, the dramatic dimension of it. So when I left school in the 1980s, in the 1990s, we didn't learn a lot about climate change. We learned about environmental issues like acid rain and the dying forests. We learned about leaded fuel and the impact on the environment. We also learned about the disappearing ozone layer. All of that subtopics of this climate change topic. Nevertheless, this global, overarching, overwhelming sword of Damocles dimension of climate change, it didn't show up in our school time. So schools can deliver a part of this knowledge. They can deliver the basic education, so the foundation to build on. And they also can build up the skills you need for the future knowledge. You need the skills to dig into the piles of data and information to find out your opinion. So when you start with that, when you start with the education here, then where do you get the other knowledge from? The actual, the, the current knowledge, the knowledge we need today. The key word here is lifelong learning. Lifelong learning as the ability to constantly update and expand your knowledge in a variety of fields. Lifelong learning to keep pace with this rapidly changing world. To, in the worst case, just survive in this world more elaborate to engage with the world, to enjoy the pleasures and the creativity of the world, but also to shape this world, to form this world and bring in your own opinion. Marian Lal von Tehran University published a quite nice definition of lifelong learning. Lifelong learning comprises all phases of learning, from preschool to post-retirement, and covers the whole spectrum of formal, non-formal and informal learning. It means that the learning is a process that occurs at all times, at all places. It should be a process of continuous learning that is directed towards not only providing the individual needs, but also that of the relevant community. So she basically says, learning takes place in all places, formal and informal, school and out of school. But she also focuses on the outcomes, directed towards not only providing the individual needs, also that of the relevant community. So we have both sides here, both directions, the gain for the person itself, but also the community engagement, the wealth for society, the change of society. So in the first part, she says, she says that it covers the whole spectrum of formal, non-formal, informal learning. What exactly does she mean by that? Where does lifelong learning happen? If you look at young children and infants, they mostly learn from their parents, from their peers. They learn at home, they learn in the daycare, they learn in the kindergarten. So mostly unstructured and unintentional, let's call it playing. Anyway, this phase is really, really important for shaping future talents and giving an introduction to learning. The second phase, roughly between, between the age of 6 and 24 years, we have a lot of educational training. So we learn in educational institutions, 
primary school, secondary school, university, apprenticeship. So we have a lot of formal structured learning here, but also family, home field, the environmental or the, organ the social organizations, religious institutions, and some mass media play a role in this phase of learning. The third phase is mainly characterized by work. Learning on the job, continuous training and development, but also hobby activities and mass media play a role here. Adults mostly learn from experience, from problem solving, so they have a totally different approach here in this phase than in the phase before that. And in the last phase, let's call it 60 plus, things change again a little bit. So job training is no longer that relevant, but instead there's far more time for hobby activities and spare time for leisure activities like traveling, like handcrafting, but also voluntary work, social work. So in this phase, learning is even more determined by the personal interests and by self-regulation. So it's again a different approach to learning. Another option here for this senior citizens is the interaction with grandchildren. There is a lot of inter interaction, a lot of possibilities to learn from the younger generations here. We see there's a lot of different places where you can learn, a lot of different situations and different motivations for learning in the different phases of life. The places of learning, the learning venues differ quite a lot. Museums and its activities are basically present in all these phases of lifelong learning. They offer programs for different age groups, from kindergarten groups to school classes, to corporations during university and education, but also to activities for senior citizens. They offer a rich variety of learning opportunities. So we know now where we can learn, but what actually do we need for lifelong learning? What do we need to update our knowledge, to be able to use the new tools which are coming up here and there? What do we need to dig deeper into the piles of information? This could be a whole talk in itself. But let me quickly introduce you to the terminology to structure the next part of my talk a bit. So when we talk about learning in museums. If a person is totally into a topic, knows every detail about it, is engaged, actively works in that topic, does tasks, does a lot of different things in that topic, one would call this person literate. So literate, literacy as the term is used in the past to define a person who is able to read and write, but today the meaning of literacy is much broader. We have a much broader definition encompassing all the abilities to be able to engage deeply with a specific topic. Literacy is usually made up of three components, three main components. One is the knowledge, the knowledge about the specific topic. The second is the skills component. Skills, either direct skills to do tasks in that specific environment, in that specific topic, or skills to apply the knowledge. And the third factor is the term volition, so the will to engage, the will to do something. One of the well-known constructs of literacy is the so-called scientific literacy, which is quite often used in education research and also um, as part of the PISA studies. So they say, a scientifically literate person is willing to engage in a recent discourse about science and technology, which requires the competencies to A, explain phenomena scientifically, which is basically the knowledge component, evaluate and design scientific inquiry, which is basically the skills component, and last but not least, to interpret data and evidence scientifically, which is a kind of combination of skills and knowledge. So I used this concept of scientific literacy quite a bit when I was working for my last employee, the Leibniz Institute for Science and Mathematics Education in Kiel. So we were developing student lab programs, outreach measures for science, and we used this concept as a basis to really frame these activities, to get a closer view on science through these activities. So when I moved on to the Deutsche Museum in 2018, I thought it might be really helpful to have this kind of framework, a similar framework for the museum learning. What does a museum visitor have to know or be able to do to really use a museum to its full extent? to be museum literate. 
So we did some research on that and had a lot of discussion with our colleagues from other museums and also the Leibniz education research institutions. And we came, last but not least, up with eight dimensions which seem relevant for this museum literacy. So the first dimension is a little bit similar, is curiosity, motivation and volition. So the interest to will to do something inside the museum. The second is information processing competence, so the skills to use the information which are presented. Three is the social competence, being able to interact either with the staff at the museum or with other visitors. Four is the emotional competencies, which is on the one hand self-regulation, on the other hand to allow feelings during a museum visit. Five is the pre-knowledge, a subject-specific pre-knowledge or a general pre-knowledge. Six is the visual literacy, so the ability to interpret signs and images. Seven is the location and behavior competence, so the ability to orient oneself in a museum, but also to maneuver through the different offers of a museum. And eight, last but not least, the appreciation of the exhibits, so the valuation of the objects of our cultural heritage. I know this is all a bit theoretical, so let me take you on a quick tour to the Deutsches Museum to see where all these different aspects show up during a normal museum visit. It's a nice sunny day in Munich, a little, little bit similar like here today. You arrive at the Deutsches Museum, you buy your ticket and you enter the building. Orientation usually is a bit tricky at the Deutsches Museum, so you walk over to the information desk and ask for the planetarium shows. They say, okay, it's at 2 p.m. Okay, then still some time left to go on. You decide to see the new special exhibition on coffee. While walking there, you're passing the ship's department. You hit, all of a sudden, you stand in front of this boat here. You're surprised by the size and by the huge masts. So you're curious. You know, it was used for fishing in the past, but when was it built? The label says it was built in 1880. Wow, quite old. You're tempted to touch the curved wood of the hull, but a sign right next to it stops you from doing so. And by the way, you very well know you're not allowed to touch objects in museums. <laughs> but instead, you smell closely to it. You smell the old wood. You smell the tar oil, which is based in the color. And you smell some, maybe some fishy remains. That makes you curious. When was the last fish caught with this boat? You read the sign, and in the text it says, the boat was restored in 1957 to be presented at the Deutsches Museum. So, no fishy remains then. But next to you at the label stands a young lady, and she's shouting out, oh, here, look at this picture. There's a steering house on the boat. Do you really think it's the same boat? You start a discussion with her on objects changing over time, on objects becoming museum exhibits, and how it, a museum must look like to house one of these giant super container ships like the one that last week moored in Bremerhaven. So let's stop this little tour here. You're not yet at the coffee exhibition. You most likely will miss the planetarium show at 2 p.m., but nevertheless, this also is museum days. But you can see, all these eight dimensions show up in different situations during a museum visit. All together allow you to use the museum to its full extent, to its full scenery. So some of them are highly generic, like information processing competence. You need that basically for every single learning process. Or like the motivation, the volition. It's also a prerequisite, prerequisite for learning in general. But some of them are highly specific to museum learning like the social interaction, the social competencies, or the location and behavior competences. These are the ones we are mostly interested in. How can we enhance them for people to have a better visit experience? How can we enable people to use the museum to its full extent? How can we draw in new visitors groups, not only those whose parents laid their museum affinity in the cradle, but also looking at formal education, how do you, what do students need to learn? What do students need to know to be able to use a museum as a valuable resource 
not only museums, but also other cultural heritage institutions, what do they need to use that for learning in school and out of school and for recreation? So there's quite a few things we have to do. We'll work on that. Developing programs and activities to enable, the, to improve the accessibility and the usability of museums. We will train our staff to be even more supportive, especially with a focus on these eight dimensions. We'll try to reach out new groups, new societal groups, to draw them into this wonderful place museum for learning, learning about climate change, but also for recreation, for just having a fun day at the museum, for exploring new things. So we now know now where we have to go, but maybe in the meantime, you can support us a little bit, just a little bit. Next time you visit a museum, have a look around, look at your co-visitors. Are they fully museum literate? Or could they need a little bit of help? Just a hint how to look at this picture, or how to use this stupid media terminal, or how to find the climate exhibition. You don't need to know all the answers, but you know a way to find the answers. Talk to them. Work together to find a solution. I'm pretty sure you will find one. And then, enjoy the warm feeling of having a challenge solved with a person who was a total stranger to you just some minutes ago. This also is a meaningful museum experience. Thank you.